So welcome everyone to this month's alumni speaker. We're going to be hearing from Jeremy Richter and I'm going to let him introduce himself and take over. Hello everyone. My name is Jeremy Richter and it's nice to come off the bench to be a speaker for you all today apparently. No. <laughs> uh, I, I knew that was the case. Hopefully you can tell by that uh, somewhat subjective attempt at humor that I don't take myself too seriously. And hopefully you can be some mm, personable throughout this uh, conversation. I use the term conversation because I hope to get you engaged. I want to set the stage out of the gate. Please ask questions. Uh, talking to a group of people, which is exciting, uh, but especially when it's a lot of uh, names, it's kind of weird to not have any feedback as to how things are going. I was talking with Kristen on various topics of what might be of use of interest. However, if you ask questions, then I can tailor answers uh, to you all and actually provide something of use. Uh, if you don't have a time to ask questions during the session, you can reach out to me uh, after, whether it's via uh, Twitter or hit me up on LinkedIn's fine uh, as well. So why, I guess, what would that be about? I'll tell you a couple snapshots uh, of myself one, uh, obviously, I have an MBA from San Bernardino. My undergrad is exercise science. In between the two, I got a master's in sports psychology over at Fresno State. I currently uh, work as a contractor with the military. I teach a lot of stuff, frankly, uh, to kind of keep things simple. Uh, one aspect is resilience training. Uh, we, def we define resilience, the ability to grow and thrive in adversity and bounce back, to take calculated necessary risk. We essentially teach 14 skills, and each skill will build up a competency. And if you have these competencies of self-awareness, being aware of what you're thinking, how you're feeling, what you're doing, self-regulation, uh, regulating how you're, what you're thinking, how you're feeling, what you're doing, optimism, which is went to reality, seeing the good in life, fighting negativity bias, having more confidence in self and team, uh, mental agility, being flexible, accurate, and thorough with your thinking, seeing multiple perspectives, uh, strengths of character, realizing, hey, each one of us has strengths. If I leverage my strengths in a very particular manner, I can be more effective in everything that I do and connection, other people matter. If I have those things, those competencies, I'm gonna be more resilient. Uh, whenever life happens, I can handle it more effectively. Or if there's a chance, I'm going to take that chance and know that it might be rough, but I'm going to make the most from it and go from there. So that's one massive section that we uh, instruct to the military. We also do performance psychology, which is getting your thoughts, your energy activation levels, like if you're really lethargic or if you're like really hyped, like, ah, let's go. Uh, it's really looking to dial in where you need to be per any given performance. So it could be fitness related. It could be public speaking. It could be taking a test. It could be giving a presentation, public speaking. Uh, anything that has some measurable component, essentially. Uh, also attention. How can you be more purposeful in being aware of where your attention is and directing it where it needs to be uh, to perform at an optimal level? Essentially, if anyone's a, a sports fan, you'll hear a lot of the best of the best always talk about those characteristics. Uh, they don't really comment on, you know, how tall they are, how much they weigh. They talk about their focus. They talk about their confidence. They talk about their ability uh, to, to push through and persevere. So we teach skills based on research to elevate performance. We also do a lot of leadership development. And I primarily work with the Army over at Na the National Training Center, Fort Irwin, about an hour and 15 away from San Bernardino in between essentially like LA and Vegas in the middle of nowhere. Uh, Barstow is a town that I actually live in and then I have to drive like almost an hour to the middle of nowhere to get on post. Uh, we do leadership for uh, NCOs. So your sergeant, staff sergeant, sergeant first class, your first sergeants, uh, sergeant majors, also officers, uh, whether it's lieutenants, captains, major, lieutenant colonel, colonel, occasionally some briefness to generals, things of that nature. Uh, so we do very purposeful leadership development, really thinking, hey, who am I as a leader? How do I operate? Why do I do what I do? Can I be more purposeful 
uh, in regards to things such as, you know, motivating, coaching, mentoring, creating an environment that's going to increase psychological safety and motivation for others. So those are some of the topics uh, that we kind of get at. We also do some other stuff like bystander intervention. I'll leave you like a little bit now. We got tasked with a little train to train on some suicide intervention just because we're known as, uh, despite what you might see here, we're known as actually good instructors. So we try to tell people how to be more effective in their instru instructing. Now I'm always like a little worried. I'm like, oh, they're going to catch every little, um, every little thing I say along the way. And it's fine if you do. So something I tend to do, just to add to this understanding, I've done this in Barstow for a little like, like two and a half years. I'm the lead instructor here. I also did the same job in Hawaii for a few years. I've gone to 13 installations to train thousands and thousands of uh, soldiers throughout the army. I've also worked on a different contract uh, with like human intelligence. So like stuff you see on TV, essentially, you know, spies, you know, like there's a mental component to that, right? If you're not regulating yourself, you're gonna freak out and, and maybe end up in a bad time to put it very mildly. So obviously it's more high stakes. So I've done things like that. Uh, along with, before doing all that, uh, I ran a weight loss gym and I uh, ran a machining and engineering company, a small, small, small company. So that's a little bit of the background on me. What I like to do is take a lot of different research and theories, ideas, and conceptualize it. And what I mean by that is I, I combine them and look for connections and build upon that into something usable, workable. You can leverage it going forward. And so I've done that for a few different things. And I was talking to Chris and I'm like, hey, what might it be of interest? And one of the things I've done is I've created what I call a motivational framework. It's essentially teaching how to create a culture of motivation based on research, taking three different theories and kind of combining them into a, a cool working product. So that's the intro, if you will, with a little bit of information slash areas where hopefully I've primed some element of curiosity, something you can ask a question on. Uh, like I said, that's going to be the, the most effective method for you actually getting something that you can take away um, in a direct manner. Otherwise, uh, I'm just going to teach, uh, not teach really, you just kind of explore things with you all at more of a conceptual uh, level. Now that I've provided all that, I want to give a purposeful pause. Is there anything you want to prime me with at this point? Anything you want to ask at this point before I introduce the framework? It's okay to ask questions, guys. Don't be scared. Someone says, like, let's dive in, let's get into it. Hey, you can you can ask along the way too. Does I'll try to take purposeful pauses. And I know it's a little awkward sometimes to uh, say things. So you can also chat it, uh, depend on, on you. It's up to you if you want to come off camera or not. If you want to say something, uh, you can just unmute and I'll try to pause or wrap up a thought. You can use a chat function, however you want to get after it. Uh, that works for me. And what's cool is, I mean, I don't, I don't know what you all uh, do. Um, then we have time to take a, a nice long poll. But a lot of this, I would suggest I'm going to talk from more of a leadership level. However, understanding that as a leader, you lead down and up. And I think a lot of people like, lose track of that. You have the ability to lead up a lot and influence those that lead you and also influence your peers. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can say and do that is going to, make a difference over time. And that's something else that I look to highlight a lot. Uh, a lot of times people focus on one moment in particular. But it's important to understand, hey, it's the moments before and after that moment that also matter, right? And so we need to take a, a long-term view of things to uh, really make a difference. Hey, Jeremy. What's yeah. up? Hey, um, so you mentioned that you underwent like a weight loss journey where you, you were a trainer, correct? If I'm, yeah, if I heard that. I, 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 I ran a weight loss clinic at helping uh -huh. hundreds of people lose pounds. All right, and then how how was that journey for the people? Like uh, more of the like mental aspect of that journey for them. Yeah, absolutely. There's gonna be a primary focus on I would say the mental aspect of things because uh, people tend to know what to do. If I said, "Hey, 
you want to lose weight, should you eat this apple or a Snickers bar? You probably know. You probably have an idea. It's the discipline. It's the motivation. It's my perception of things. It's how do I approach planning? Uh, how do I create this narrative after I have a setback? Or how do I create this narrative after I have a success? It's all of those aspects of things, and like stress management as well, that come into play. That's going to help increase the likelihood of someone's success. And within that, a big part of it was adapting myself to say, hey, what does this person truly need in this moment to help them move forward, uh, to be essentially more compliant following the, the, the workout plan and the, the nutrition plan that we gave them uh, underneath uh, some professional guidance. So it was very much a focus on, on those things to help people navigate through the long process, depending on how much weight they had to lose. So, so following the weight loss, did you uh, manage to touch base with those, um, those people you helped out um, afterwards, like, you know, follow up, hey, you know, I'm building better um, form of customer relationships with them, etc. Yeah, so uh, I tried to, and I tried to very much maintain those relationships and essentially look to um, encourage them as sort of ambassadors for the program too, right? Because obviously, uh, if someone loses 100 pounds, everyone that knows that person is going to see that, realize that. And I think it's important to maintain really strong relationships and good rapport with them. So I try to do things along the line. Um, this was earlier on in my career. So I was subject to a leader that was not very effective, uh, if you will. And so sometimes like, like we had to have back and forth conversations on how we would do things and how much leeway I had to truly uh, build those relationships. But frankly, uh, in, in the end, like, when I left, I was like, hey, I'm, I'm out. Uh, I went to Hawaii. Uh, the owners were just some, some toxic people. And I was like, hey, I'm, I'm just kind of moving on my way. There's a couple people that added me on social media that you know we have stayed in touch. But it's kind of like a, a knowing ending, if you will. Hey, but, hey, but, but. In a sense, it's a good thing because you generated, you know, earned media. So they were, you know, speaking about it, promoting your, you know, your, how you helped them with the weight loss journey, you know, which, um, you know, actually generated more clients for yourself or, you know, the organization as a whole. So that's pretty cool. Thanks, Jeremy. Sure thing. And, and I would say even there with, with nice to know, obviously word of mouth makes a difference, but uh, to tap into uh, the tipping point by Malcolm Gladwell, like everyone isn't good for word of mouth. There's a, a couple of no's of people that are really effective. And so within that, there are some people that would send us a lot of people. Like their word of mouth was very powerful, very impactful, uh, whether it was the relationship they had, whether they were known as quote an expert in finding whatever product it is and just had a natural tendency to share with people. Uh, so it was nice to learn about that later and go, oh, no wonder. There's some people that would be, you know, really helpful for us. And those are the people that as a business, we should definitely focus on as well, because they're giving us a massive return where someone else, if I give them the same effort, I get one or two people. Uh, and so just being aware of even, we hear word of mouth a lot, but there's a lot of different ways in which we can, you know, capitalize upon that. So, so did you guys capitalize more on the social media aspect? Because I know more, uh, you know, business is becoming more like digitalized where, um, social media is um, prevailing and it, it allows for a channel to actually market, you know, the business. Um, did you see that on your, your end where they no, promoted I, your, you know, weight loss? Hey, like this is Jerry, you know, Jeremy helped me lose a hundred plus pounds, which, you know, in turn. Uh, yeah, more no, people we, we didn't. Uh, a lot of the social aspect of things was very minor. And I feel like, you know, it, it's a full-time proposition these days. Uh, to really be effective in navigating all that. But for us, spending some time didn't really get us much at all. It was, we just kind of, it was more in the face to face since they're coming in weekly. And whatever they did, uh, they did. We'd encourage some things and we tried to build up a, a presence. Uh, but fundamentally, it was uh, really the, the frequency in face to face or phone calls that make a difference. Thank you for answering the questions. Of course. So <clears throat> we're in this uh, motivational framework, if you will. I'm going to hit it at a certain level. It, 
it could go on for a long time. There's a lot of depth and complexity. My goal is to make it simplistic, uh, easy to, um, I don't know, I, I guess just not, you know, easy to like conceptualize for yourself. And what does that look like in thinking about uh, your company and so forth? So <clears throat> overall, I can show you a really, uh, uh, I really should ref, uh, refer back to this at some point, but you should all see this, it's kind of weird looking M. Yeah. I'm not a graphic designer. It's really terrible on, on some aesthetics, but fundamentally, Here's what we're getting at with this framework. On the very bottom is like the foundation, if you will. And this is where you see um, how we're gonna have the conversation. Step one, commit to core values. Step two, there has to be a desire to improve. And three, you have to reason each success and failure. So that's the journey that we're go down as we uh, talk about this framework and motivation. And you'll see each aspect on the M, you have organization, there's core values to this culture. And then we see some communication and then we start to get into the other areas of desire to improve and how we uh, process each success and failure. So I'll leave that up for the first uh, aspect of things in case people wanna see it, then I'm gonna uh, take it down as to not be too distracting. Fundamentally, people talk about morale a lot. They talk about culture a lot. What are these things? They say, hey, we, we need to have a better culture. They have a great culture. And I think you all being uh, in highly educated group, you've seen case studies of organizations that do very well and some that have not done very well. It's a very simple, simple proposition according to my point of view is it comes down to core values. Right, what are the foundational things that make up what that company is about? I suggest this should be around four to six, because if you go beyond six, now you're going to have some redundancy and some overlap, which you're not really talking the core at that point. And it's hard for people to really keep track. Uh, under four, um, perhaps you're not being as encompassing as you could be. So that's that's why I go there. Now, there's always exceptions. Right? Uh, a certain company can go uh, under or above. For instance, the Navy has three, the Army has seven core values. And I'm like, mm, that's a little much, but the Army, it makes a nice acronym leadership uh, in the sense with they leave out some vowels. So it makes uh, some sense for them. However, uh, identify core values. And if the company has these core values, that should dictate what the culture is. The culture is based on those core values. I think it's a really simple proposition, right? a real simple proposition. But we're going to take a little moment here and pause as to why we're doing that, as to why we're going to talk about these core values. So essentially, with motivation, right? With motivation, uh, let's hear some of the things. Actually, let's hear. I'm going to put out to you all to, to prime you all. What are some of the things that motivate you? What motivates you? Either Throw it in the chat or come off mute. Let's hear some of the things that motivate you and we'll, we'll go from there. So for work, for me, I'm motivated. I motivate myself. I like knowing that I did a good job up to my standards, not necessarily what I did for anyone else. Um, it, I don't care, like if, I mean, I care obviously if my boss likes it, right? Um, but if I don't do a good job, I'm unmotivated to then move forward in progress for myself. Let's see. Excellent, um, thank you, Kristen. Yeah. Um, so there's some other stuff in the chat. So uh, family, positive energy, liking to learn new things self-improvement, uh, a couple more family, um, setting goals, and then constant growth. Yeah, excellent. Uh, growth, family knowledge, meeting people. Okay. 
Wonderful. Got some engagement. Hey, thank you all very much. Appreciate that. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more if I gave you time or, and or if I said, hey, I need you each to come up with eight things. Uh, then also you have to maybe think a little more in depth, like, oh, what are some of the other things that motivate me? So some basic things we know also that compensation matters, money matters. Also, sometimes you do things because you don't want to get fired, <laughs> like punishment matters. So overall, we know rewards and punishment can be motivators, whether that's for children, employees, uh, friends, whatever it may be, absolutely can be motivators. We also know shame and guilt can be motivators. Uh, perhaps there's some of you who you think about like, uh, I told them I would do this, so I better do this because you don't want to feel guilty. You don't want to feel like a sense of shame or, it's, hey, I don't want to let them down. Fundamentally, as humans, we do not enjoy feeling shame or guilt. Of those two sources of motivation, uh, they're very uh, instrumental is the research uh, like term essentially. Uh, it's an instrument of change. If you add those things, if I add reward or punishment, or if I add shame or guilt, I get a change happening. If I take the instrument away, the change ceases to exist or occur. It's not a surprise that those sources of motivation, rewards, punishment, shame, and guilt, the sustainability is suspect. It's very lacking. At a certain point, it doesn't matter. Like, I don't care. Uh, I, I can even say, hey, I want $5 to do five burpees. Maybe you're like, yeah, I will. At some point, like, I don't care. The money's not worth it. And maybe some of you right now are thinking, nope, not going to do it even for five bucks. And that's fine. Or even punishment. I think back to you know being a kid and talking back to my parents and having to pull some weeds. You know, and that's our labor. And at some point, I'm like, I'm going to save my piece and I'm just going to deal with it. <laughs> like, it didn't stop me. <laughs> we just don't, we don't care. And we're going to shame or guilt. Sometimes like, whatever, I'm going to deal with it. And that's all there is to it. They can be easier to implement, especially with motivating other people, though. And so something to keep in mind that they're not sustainable. We default to them because of ease. Uh, and sometimes for ourselves, uh, we look to utilize it too, right? I could say, uh, if I'm going on a, a long run to train for a marathon, I can say, hey, if I get back from that run, I can have a protein cookie. That's nice. Or if I don't go on the run, then I got to get up early on a Monday morning and go for the run before work. And that sucks. <laughs> so I better do it. Or if I'm, you know, tell my coworkers about it, they're going to ask me, hey, did you go on your run? And I don't be like, no, I didn't go on the run. <laughs> like, Ugh, that's gross. So all lacking sustainability, and I'm not really taking ownership of that motivation. But if we start to shift towards more internal motivation, we see we can value the outcome of the behavior. I do something because it's going to lead to something good for me, essentially. Uh, so if I'm thinking about that long run, I'm like, hey, I got to go on this long run because it's going to help me get ready for that marathon. Also, it's going to pretty much help reduce the likelihood of many physical and mental illnesses. Not to mention, heck, I might lose a few pounds and look pretty good. Like, okay, there's a lot of good reasons for going on that run. That's a little bit more sustainable, a little bit more powerful. But getting to our core values as an individual, which pertains to a lot of what was mentioned, uh, potentially, and I don't really, you know, I didn't prime y'all for more explanation and rationale. But things like family or pride in, in doing it for myself, or growth, uh, to experience, uh, you know, positive emotion, to if I value connection and meeting people. If I leverage my own values, it now changes how I experience whatever event it may be. If one of my values is greatness, where everyone can improve, you can learn from others and inspire other people, all of a sudden that long training run, it changes. As I'm running, I'm like, all right, no matter how I feel in that moment, it's like, hey, I'm living according to who I am. And as I do so, I'm going to have a greater sense of autonomy, which is a key aspect for human beings. And one simple example of how autonomy is so powerful is I've been home for, you know, the holidays when I was in school. I remember seeing like a full trash. I'm like, oh, I should take out the trash. That'd be nice. And then right before I do that, my mom says, hey, Jeremy, can you take out the trash, please? I'm like, I don't want to. Which is absurd. I should help my mother. She's a lovely mother. I was just thinking about doing it. But in that quick little moment, I got a little autonomy shipped away. And so we can start to see like, and that's a tiny, silly example, but fundamentally humans 
uh, enjoy having autonomy. Not only that, but we're going to have more focus, more concentration. We're going to have more persistence. We're going to have more positive emotion. We're going to have a greater sense of flow, which is something that's a phenomenal topic uh, I, I could really get into uh, ethically, which I might later on. Uh, and fundamentally, we're going to be much more effective and, and motivated, and no one can ever take that away from me. It's always within me. And that leads us closer to what's called uh, intrinsic motivation, which is just doing something because it's fun to do. Uh, think about your hobbies. You probably do your hobbies because they're fun to do. Uh, but a lot of times at work, we have to do things that we have to do, not that are just fun. We just want to do it. All that's, that's a really quick overview of self-determination theory. So as an individual, I can tap into my values and be more motivated, but also I can leverage that understanding for the organization itself. And if I have the values, I can leverage how the culture is going to be and define how their culture is going to be in a very purposeful manner. And I can look to hire people and bring on people that have an alignment of values. Not saying that you're looking for clones, not saying that you're looking for everyone that thinks in the same manner. However, thinking about how motivated you want an organization to be, it's nice to have that alignment of some personal values to the organizational values to a degree. Uh, because it's, they're gonna go hand in hand, that person is gonna have all those benefits that we talked about, more autonomy, more satisfaction, more perseverance, uh, more enjoyment, more flow, more optimal moments in their life. A key opportunity to enable that to occur comes from times where we give effective criticism and effective praise. A lot of times there's a likelihood that we're good at giving effective criticism. We've heard enough about that. Hey, I can't just call you a, a knucklehead. I gotta add what you did wrong and tell you how to fix that. Sometimes the praise though, we get potentially lazy we say, hey, good job. Way to get after it. Thumbs up. It's very generic. So with praise, we want to also note the strategy, the effort, the behavior that that person did well. Therefore, they know what they did well. They can learn from that and have a greater likelihood of repeating it. And it shows that I care about them. It's even more powerful if I note that someone did well I point out the action that they took and if I connect that to the values of what we're about. So if locally, if I think about my team, uh, maybe I had, uh, you know, maybe there's a coworker who, you know, read some research and, you know, set a meeting for us to talk about it so that we could all be aware of it. I could say, hey, good job. Nah, eh, it's weak. That's it. Hey, good job taking the effort to find the research and to set up the conversation so that we could uh, all learn from it. And that right there, like I have such a tendency, but the next level is, hey, so we can all learn from it, helping us at large grow and develop because that's what we're about here. We're about growing and I appreciate you helping us do just that. And so it, if I'm purposeful in my communication as to, if I ask, hey, can you do this? And you know, maybe you're familiar with Simon Sinek, start with why, like, hey, what's the purpose? What's the rationale? Like, add the why, connect it, but also connect it to the values at large too. Um, you know, whenever things happen, it's like, hey, but we're about this here. Like, it's a chance to add to the environment and the culture itself. And that could be a microcosm. So maybe you're not the, you know, you're not the top boss, but whatever team you have, uh, it can still work. Or again, as you communicate with your boss, your peers, you can look to influence a potential microculture within a group. That being said, if you have a toxic leader hire, uh, they could come out at any point and just smash it <laughs> and blow it up. And you see a lot of that in the army. Uh, you get some great leaders, uh, but then at some level, it's some leader that's not so great. And he just, he blows everything up and they have to kind of rebuild it. So that's self-determination theory based on Ryan and Desi, uh, kind of setting the, the groundwork for ourselves as individuals, but also uh, an organization. 
and you can see the alignment taken in place. Let me take a purposeful pause before we move on to part two. Any questions, anything I can clarify for you at this point? All right, so part two, uh, a desire to improve. There can be, th this looks at uh, really like achievement goal theory is the area that's called from a uh, really growth mindset. If you've ever heard of that term, growth mindset, Carol Dweck's work um, as well. Achievement goal theory is more Nichols' work um, and Duda has done some of the things as well. Uh, they talk about essentially like Nichols' work is, hey, you can be or uh, ego oriented or task oriented. Ego basically says, hey, I want to be better than all of you, and I'm gonna and I'm motivated to kick your ass. <laughs> like I don't care what it is, I want to be the best. I want to beat you up, whatever it is. Competitive people, like a lot of athletes, they're gonna be high ego orientation because they they want to win at everything, right? You might have heard stories of you know Michael Jordan. Um, uh, just wants to win at everything, right? Cards, golf, you name it, basketball, baseball, he just wants to win. So high ego orientation. Then there's something called task orientation, which is, hey, I want to be better than I was before. I'm going to be better than I was yesterday, better than I was even earlier today. I want to improve my own ability. And if you think about high uh, ego orientation and uh, task orientation, you can have both. You can have both. Let me try to give Nestle a visual aid. So again, I'm not a graphic designer, I get lazy. Um, for our actual job, uh, we, we have uh, some curriculum. This is something else that I've done though, so it's not else snazzy. So you can look at this as, as you like, but if, it makes sense. If I'm low ego orientation, like, hey, I don't care if I'm better than anyone. And if I'm low task oriented, I don't care if I'm better than I was. I'm probably not motivated. <laughs> like, what are you going to get from me? Not much. I don't really care. And I can have high in one and low in one. If, and we see if I'm high in, in uh, ego, but low in task, there's a chance I might avoid challenges. I might be that person that's like, oh, I didn't really do much. I didn't really put myself, uh, I didn't really put much effort into it. Oh, I, I studied for 10 minutes. It's that person that's you know trying to play off how well they've done, how much effort they've done, because that gives them an excuse. They might be more embarrassed uh, to put themselves out there in a time that they know other people are good. Whereas if someone's low ego, great, uh, high task, they just want to grow and get better. They're not concerned with other people. They want to grow and get better. However, uh, that can be nice, but if you're still below standard, you still suck. <laughs> That's not good either. You, like there's a certain standard you got to be at, you know? So as an individual, it's nice to have high in both. You can tap into whichever one you need to. Like, hey, well, am I look competitive? I, I want it to come out. But also, I'm really focused on my own growth and development. As an organization, the difference is, as a leader, you want to cultivate, and this is where we get into like a, we kind of a really long discussion on this. Like I said, everything can be much, much longer. As a leader, I want to encourage an environment of low ego and high task orientation. I do not want people competing with each other. Which for some people, like, like, oh yeah. Some people are like, mm, I don't know about that nonsense. Uh, so it's interesting to concern your beliefs that you might have. Uh, and again, I wish we could really explore much, you know, if we had eight more hours, uh, we could really get crazy into it or even five more hours. But fundamentally, uh, there's a term called psychological safety, like how safety people feel uh, in a given working environment. Uh, to put it simply and uh, an easy resource, uh, again, to reference Simon Sinek, uh, Leaders Eat Last. Yeah, he also has a TED Talk on that too. Uh, it's an easy, easy uh, reading resource uh, to get a feel for things. 
fundamentally, if there's no psychological safety, uh, you're going to limit growth, limit potential because people aren't going to stretch themselves. They're not going to put themselves out there because at any point they can look a fool. And if it's a really high competitive environment within a group, it can be backstabbing. Like, do I really want to help you? Not really. Like, I need to look better than you. I'm going to stomp on you at some point. I might even, you know, even worse is I'm going to be nice to you and pretend, and then I'm going to stab you in the back eight times. <laughs> like, that is massively hindering to that individual's growth and to the organizational growth. The nice part of the competition though comes in saying, hey, we're going to compete with other people, right? Like my company is going to battle your company. We're going to kick your ass because everyone in here is rising up. If I have every single person getting better, it's going to raise all this up, right? We, we've heard that before. So that's a, a gist of how things might be. So this aspect of self-growth, improving, again, is part of communication. Are you helping that person grow? Are you pushing them into a position to grow and get better and where it's okay to fail? All right, and that's where a lot of this, like as I give examples, like ah, I've heard that before. What's nice about these frameworks is as you consume more information, as you read more articles, as you listen to people, as you think back, if you have this lens, it's going to add a sense of clarity. Like, oh, duh, of course, that's how it should be. What happens often, though, is that as experienced business leaders share, they'll, they'll say these cliches, but implementing them is very difficult. So it's not about implementing a cliche. It's not about implementing what someone says. It's about saying, hey, what's a framework? And how do I make that framework um, work for my organization the best? And then I can implement it that way. And I can view things in such a manner. So fundamentally, it's just helping people grow and get better in a safe environment, pushing them to take risk. If they feel psychological safety, they know they're not going to get stabbed in the back. They're going to get some help. And they have that opportunity to say, hey, I want to try this. <laughs> like, I'm going to try something. Like, oh, I have an idea. And if I fall flat on my face, and this is where you know, different researchers, uh, different, I can't think of an example, but they're like, hey, we celebrate failures. If I fall on my face, I'm not stabbed. I'm not stepped on. I'm not lit on fire. Like People raise me up higher and celebrate me. And when you hear we celebrate failures, that's what they're trying to say. They're saying, hey, we care about growth environment. They just say it in a weird, nuanced way that works for them. It doesn't have to look that way. So that's what I'm saying with this, uh, the, the concept. And that's where it's nice if you uh, align that uh, within the overall values to a degree as well. So now you get some coupling. And this is the day-to-day, -day, right? Like, how are things going? Hey, where are we about? Um, how do you navigate um, communication with each other? And then we got one more block. We have until 5.30, is that correct? Or 5.15, 5.30? Okay, cool. So we have one more block. And this is this is based on a little bit of like attribution theory slash explanatory style. Fundamentally, uh, we create this narrative in our mind as we go throughout our days as to why things happen. Not only that, our narratives can start to be slanted one way or the other. And we start to dwell on this narrative, even though a lot of times it's just made up nonsense. It's not factual at all. Our brains are lazy because there's so much information in the world, it has to take shortcuts. And our brain likes to be quick. And it works well for us a lot, but sometimes it doesn't. <clears throat> and so I'm, I, I'm trying not to go too crazy in depth uh, with this one, because again, it's much more uh, intense, but I can look to, mm, I, should, I should make a better visual here. The existing one's not so good. Okay. Go back to here. So essentially, uh, I can have a success and I can have a failure. Everyone knows that. Everyone has successes. Everyone has failures. We interpret why those happen. Each one of us says, here's why that success happened. Here's why that failure happened. 
Uh, and if you're leaving that up to chance, there's a chance that you're very much harming how you view yourself and how you view the world. And if you take it into your uh, control, you can get massive dividends and massive motivation returns uh, taking place. Oh, actually, okay, well, so what we could do is think about really comes down to optimistic and pessimistic thinking. People often say, hey, I'm an optimistic person. Like, or like, I'm an optimist. I'm a pessimist. Like, no, you're, you're a person. That's, that's what you are. Like, that, that's really all, all it is. All right. Uh, bad times. <laughs> so it's how we think, right? Optimistic thinking or pessimistic thinking is just one way that we think. And like anything else, it's called, uh, if we do it more, then it's going to form habits for us and, and patterns, things of that nature. And it's like called neuroplasticity. So if there's something bad that happens or a failure, oh, let me see here. If something bad happens, actually, no, let me finish this part. Sorry, I could have done this ahead of time, I suppose, but. I didn't think I didn't think about it until this moment. Format shape. Cool. All right. Bad times. See this box? You need to put bad times in a box. You need to contain it. The uh, the research in the literature talks about pervasiveness and permanence. Uh, fundamentally, don't let it bleed over, right? Like, if something bad happens, keep it contained. It's for one specific thing. That's it. And it does not go on forever. It lasts for one moment, and that's it. Contain bad. Contain bad. Keep it very contained and keep it very short-lived. And that means we should probably do the opposite. So for simplicity, I'm not gonna go all crazy, but just imagine it's like, it's like a little cool, like it's like, like a firework. Yeah, that's a nice little imagery there. So you want good times to bleed over, like, let's go. I'm great. Like let the goodness reign over and let it last, let it keep going, let it keep going. Essentially, that's what optimistic thinkers do. Pessimistic thinkers do the opposite. So in sum, bad, contain, good, let it bleed out and spread out. Whole lot harder to actually implement than to just talk about it, how I did really briefly there. But thinking about as you mentor someone, as you coach someone, as you guide someone, as you talk about things with the boss, a spouse, wife, kids, doesn't really matter who you're, you know, whether it's yourself or others, if something happened and they say, hey, uh, this happened and here's why it happened, but they're creating this narrative. And in that moment, you can start to be aware, you go, oh, this bad thing's happening. And now there's, they're, they're letting it bleed over. They're letting it just consume every aspect of their work. Right, and it could even be something like, oh, hey, my, my boss, my boss gave me like the whole on a minute thing today. And, and I kind of talked to him. And then all of a sudden that turns into like, hey, this is just a shitty boss. It's like, it just bleeds over. It just expands for that person. And it does it even more so if the habitual thinking takes place in that manner. So then it's just about how do we navigate our conversations with each other? And then really, even more important, how do I navigate the conversation in my head? Am I aware of what I'm doing, how I'm explaining things? Uh, an easy example, right? So uh, if a kid loses some keys for a car and you're like, hey, we got to look for it. It's $500 key fob. And if you see the kid sitting there after, you know, 10 minutes, you might think this kid is lazy. What a lazy kid. Not even looking for the keys. But like, is the kid lazy? 
I don't know. That kid does a lot of other things. Maybe that kid runs. The kid plays sports. The kid works on homework. The play, kid plays a lot of video games. He does clean up his room. He does this. Like, he does a lot of things. A lot of things that aren't considered lazy. So one quick example, like that kid is late. We let it bleed over to the whole character. It's that character assassination, if you will. And that can be very problematic because one time is fine. But if I, if I do that again and again and again through other little moments, like, Oh, didn't put away the Cheez-Its. Yeah, kid's lazy. Then put this way, kid's lazy. Then all of a sudden, now I'm viewing that person with such a lens. And we can get into other biases and things and how no matter what now, it's going to be really hard to change. I have a belief. I'm now skewing every evidence to prove myself right. So instead, it's being aware, okay, hold on. If I see this, hey, the kid uh, didn't take the effort to fully put away the Cheez-Its today. I got to contain it. Same thing with coworker, right? Then refill the paper. You're lazy, you know, you're a slacker. You always want other people to do everything for you. Like it just bleeds over. So we got to contain it. And then good stuff, uh, you know, it's, hey, we always help each other, right? So if someone, you know, uh, brings in some you know, cookies, hey, we take care of people around here. We care about people. I appreciate you looking after us. And it, it, we, we expand it beyond. Expand it beyond. And if I'm able to do that, then that alone, that shift in thinking can help me fight the negativity bias, which means that I won't be as likely to see the negative stuff and to remember the negative stuff in someone. I'm going to have a greater likelihood of seeing the good in my world. I'm going to have more confidence in myself and others. I'm going to have better relationships with them, which makes sense, right? Like if if I'm always attacking the character of someone, I'm probably gonna to start to resent them. However, if I isolate that and if I bleed over good, I'm gonna I'm gonna appreciate them more. That's gonna impact how I say even good morning. Morning. Hey, good morning. Like those little things can make a difference over time. And again, having that long um, aspect of things, but also thinking about success and failures. So now think about that person who, you know, is growth-minded, takes a chance, fails. Hey, you failed. Did you fail the whole project? Well, kind of, but really within the project, what's the specific thing that you failed at? And what are the other things that you did good? Like, let's bleed those out. And so we can see how if I am able to shift that perception, that then fosters more of that growth environment, which then aligns with the overall culture. And now everyone at each individual and organizational wide is feeding into itself, creating this concept of motivation. Uh, the attribution theory was Weiner, W E I N E R 85. And then, uh, Martin Seligman is a considered like a godfather of like positive psychology. I just finished one of his books uh, today. He, he's done like a ton of research on explanatory style, mind blowing, just awesome. And I've known this, stuff, I've like, taught this for years, but like, just as you hear about it more and more and live more life and see more incidences, you're like, oh, I'll be darned. Um, and like those examples I'm coming up with, like stuff that happened, you know, yesterday, <laughs> like this kid literally is being late. I'm like, Oh no, he's not though. Like, Oh, Jeremy, easy now. Like, Ooh, okay. Uh, be better. <laughs> so it just shows uh, like the complexity of, of these topics and, and what they can do for us. And like anything else, you can layer in other strategies to kind of make it easier. So that's the at large, uh, framework, if you will, and with the explanation of how it all fed into each other. I'm, you know, I, I debated whether or not to go into because of the time hack that we had, we had less time available than is really warranted. I just want to show you this one more time, All right? So we had the organizational core values form the culture and we say, hey, I'm going to communicate intent why we're doing what we're doing as it pertains to things and feedback. Right? How do I get effective praise, effective criticism that then goes into this desire to improve along with, hey, am I setting this culture of growth, psychological safety where people can take chances? Uh, and hey, when you have success, let's live it. If you have failures, let's contain it. So that's, that's the gist of things. Uh, I like to open it up for hopefully questions Something, something that I can clarify for you at this point.
Hi, Jeremy. I have a question. All right. Let me turn on my camera. Hopefully my room is fine. Um, you know, I, I feel the, the urgency to steal yourself, right? You, you're stealing yourself in regards to your mindset and approaching life in such a way that um, you dictate how you feel about things coming at you, right? You, you control your response, your behavior. Um, but you find when you're in those moments where you're dealing with um, a toxic person or a dysfunctional situation, um, and you're the goody two shoes, Mr. Positive guy, you know, and it just becomes, it just falls flat over and over. Let's go, you know, we can do this. Um, you know, because they're smart people too, and they don't want to be played psychologically and all that kind of stuff. It, 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 you know what I'm saying? It kind of, how do you deal with those situations? And usually when you're dealing, and not when it's a subordinate, but usually your peers or a peer group or a team, you know, that's, um, because that's, I think that's what happens is you go back and go, oh, I, I like your put it in a box thing. I really like that. And I think that that's a, a real strong mental tool. Um, but after a while, it, it kind of just erodes the relationship, you know? So I think language is very vital and it's such a good point. It's, hey, we gotta be positive. Hey, let's get out. Like that's lip service a lot. And that's, and that comes from, hey, I, I've heard these things. I have an idea of something, but I don't really know what I'm speaking of. Like, and that's where if, if you speak from a place of greater understanding, and that's why I wanted to present these topics. Really, it's like, here's some things to consider and to read into. And I can provide many more resources uh, on your own or follow up on conversations um, happily to help improve that knowledge. It gives you a greater sense of how to have that conversation where whole put in a box, right? Like it, it, if something happens, right? If something doesn't go well. I'm like, hey, if that happened. We did our diligence to acknowledge it. We're aware of it. What can we do moving forward and to take action to get after things? Like, and, and just kind of being consistent and understanding that if it's a peer or a leader, it's again, it's not about that one win. Uh, it's like, hey, if I do this 800,000 times, like eventually it's going to, it's like a Grand Canyon. The water's going to cut through eventually. Um, if you're trying to do what you can and ultimately understanding at the end of the day, you don't have control over other people. You sometimes just got to wave the white flag and say, Hey, what can I do for myself to get my thoughts dialed in for me and just understand, Hey, that person has to operate at that level. I have to do what I can as best that I'm able to. I appreciate, um, using the right words and, 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 and not saying about being a cheerleader though, I, let's to clarify it. Just, you know, you know, trying to stay moving forward and, you know, and accomplishing the goals and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I, as a consensus builder, you know, that's kind of where I like to build my man, my leadership style is building consensus. Um, but every once in a while, there's somebody who's just, you know, is view is so far from the group that it's kind of hard to move the whole group towards that point. So, um, but I think you have a lot of great advice. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah, my, my pleasure. And, and it's hopefully it gets like a little intro uh, uh, to things that, in, you know, I, I didn't know if I should do one in more depth or as many. Uh, I, I went back and forth. So I, I apologize if, if maybe the more in one depth would have been more. Well, you, you have you, a, you, you, you rattled off a lot of um, references. So if there was a reference sheet that you, I would love to see that, you know. Uh, I, can, I can email with Kristen later and she can hopefully disseminate it. I Thank you very images. much. Thank yeah. you. And also, I want to encourage, hey, uh, you talk about, you know, networking, right? Like, always feel free to reach out, with, again, whether it's, you know, uh, Twitter or uh, LinkedIn, right? Or uh, even email, like, hey, re reach out to me and I, I, I can talk with y'all, right? Like, hey, you gave us talking about, cool, hey, what's up? How, how can I help? It, it's, it's fun. It's fun to do that, too. So you have multitude of avenues for, for things, absolutely. We have a couple more minutes if anyone wants to ask a question. I have a question. Um, let me start my video. I'm sorry, I'm sitting in my car. So all you're gonna see is this bright light. But um, I, I, 
I, I have a question about motivation. Um, when it comes to, you know, being in, in a role for a long time and not getting that promotion that um, you, you deserve or that your even your immediate boss, you know, your manager's telling you you deserve, how do you make sure that doesn't affect your day-to-day, right? Um, feeling less motivated or going into like a, a slump, um, what, what would you recommend? I really like the, the word choices and, and what you're sharing with us. So just wanted to get a different perspective than what's going on in my head. That's not always positive, right? Yeah, sure. So I, you know, the, the, the framework for yourself is saying, hey, what are my own values? Am I aware of them? A lot of times people are like, yeah, I know. But if I said for I mean, a lot of people, not necessarily you, hey, where are they right now? Tell me. It's like, uh, and so first I'd say, hey, create your four to six core values, know what they are with very much purpose. And thinking about those values as you do what you're going to do throughout the day is one aspect of things. The other is saying, hey, what can I learn and grow and develop and help other people uh, in my job? And then also a key aspect is stuff, something like the promotion is very much a tendency to be like, oh, I'm never going to get promoted. Uh and I'm not saying that's what your thought is, but there's thoughts like that where, hey, here's a bad thing that's happening and it's going to always last like this. They're never going to see how good I do. I'm never going to get my opportunity. Uh, like these, these types of thinking that go on and on with a, it never ends. Uh, those types of thoughts can really, they can drive something called helplessness and hopelessness. So it's really dialing in and saying, hold on, what am I thinking right now? Am I letting my thoughts go on and on about something or am I containing it and being aware, all right, that's happened. Uh, I'm gonna do whatever I can going forward. That's in my control. We'll see if there's an opportunity. If there's not one here, do I wanna weigh the option of maybe seeking uh, something elsewhere? Uh, but if I'm living according to my values, that's where you hear stories and again, different case studies you'll, you'll read across. Someone's really happy or like the movie Soul, uh, 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 the Disney movie, Cut in Hair. Yeah. He has a purpose. He's living his values in that moment. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, it is 530. um, So I know that some students have classes and stuff tonight. um, And I don't want to abuse your time, Jeremy, because I know it is valuable. and We really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. So um, if anyone has questions, please reach out. He's very graciously offered on LinkedIn. Um, you can connect with him through me if you need to. Um, just let us know. We're here to, to make those connections and get you guys motivated and move on. Jeremy, I want to thank you so much for your time. Um, it's always a pleasure having you join us. And um, I look forward to hopefully you joining us again. Well, appreciate it, everyone. Uh, hopefully you got something. Like I said, reach out and uh, take care. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you, Jeremy.